we're switching topics a little bit. Uh, we're going to have Professor Dev Singh from uh, the New Cross Hospital in Wolverhampton. He's a consultant physician in diabetes and endocrinology at the Wolverhampton Diabetes Centre. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, Dev. I have absolutely no conflicts of interest to declare, but I have to say that I'm conflicted. Um, I don't know where Paul O'Hare is. Where are you, Paul? Hands up. Oh, he's gone home. Where? He's uh, my, my career-long friend, peer, and colleague, took to one side and said, Dev, no jokes about cardiologists and renal doctors. But then I took a straw poll amongst cardiologists and uh, amongst diabetologists, and they all to a man said, crack a joke. Cliff Bailey, Professor Cliff Bailey, who when I first met him was 10 years my senior and now looks 10 years my junior, equipped me with said joke, but it's far too salacious for me to repeat it. I'm, I'm hoping, however, to, to make good friends of you. Um, my cardiology and renal colleagues are erudite, brave in their implementation of, uh, of clinical evidence into the clinical workplace, go-getters. And we diabetologists just want to say we're so grateful that you're now working for us, um, looking after the diabetes population. I would also like to say that I'd like to engage you um, away from HbA1c into a mechanistic understanding of glycation. Yes, that's glycation. Um, and the third thing I'd like to say is, being not a cardiologist, I know everything. <laughs> or not, as the case may be. Glycation. So glycation, we know, is a really important mechanism of glucose binding to protein, through a process in an irreversible way uh, in covalent bonds um, that relates to the concentration of glucose. And we know that the products of glycation and the downstream product products are fundamental to cardiovascular vascular complications, whether you have diabetes or not. And we know that these all intermingle in the fantastic, still relevant Brownlee concept um, with other mechanisms of vascular complication, including uh, the oxidative stress mechanisms, um, structural abnormalities, tissue edema, tissue hypoxia, and myriads of metabolic problems that cause damage. And in diabetes, we are equipped with a glycation product, the glycated hemoglobin, that simultaneously reflects to us our average glycemic attainment and is a marker of glycation. Are we not lucky? Well, maybe not. Can I implore you to join with me in a sort of retarded view of the HbA1c. Let us pretend the sun moves around the earth. The earth is flat. Of course, we might take a perspective on that, and perhaps we might engage in the notion of how dogma and belief systems uh, underpin some of our views which we think are scientific. And we might engage in the thinking person's approach to how we look at evidence, and indeed, we might even look at some science. So if anybody ever gets a chance to follow that wiki link, it is absolutely wonderful. So I'm going to start with the Greeks and a few Indians. So the Earth is flat is dogma, it's a belief system. In fact, I'm pretty convinced that a Stone Age man or woman standing on both a guest, looking out across the beautiful sea, looking at the horizon, knew if they walked a day or so to the top of Snowdon, they could see the Isle of Man. 
And they probably thought, I'm looking over the horizon and worked out that the Earth was not flat. But those in the know said it was. In the 6th century BC and thereafter, the great names of philosophy said, no, it's not, and produced arguments in favor of that. And in the 3rd century BC, uh, Eratosthenes, well, I can't believe that he actually stuck a stick in Alexandria and a stick somewhere else and measured the angle of the sun, or at least uh, um, he didn't do it on his own. He must have had a bunch of people working together and looking at the angles, um, thereby worked out the circumference of the Earth. And depending on whether which measure you used of length, because it wasn't standardized, he was somewhere between 5% and 20% inaccurate. In other words, 95% accurate. That's pretty amazing. But it is not definitive proof. Magellan, who actually didn't make it all the way around the Earth, unfortunately, but the circumnavigation of the Earth was probably seen as definitive truth. By then, everybody believed that the Earth was round. However, that belief system took 20 centuries to execute. Now, the H1C is the gold standard measure of glycemic control. I'm going to tell you that that is dogma. It is increasingly believed in many, many different ways and massively used in clinical trials as an outcome measure, as the gold standard measure. Deviation of HbA1c from prevailing glycemia actually is very, 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 really, really, really common and important. This is true because I said so. <laughs> I have roughly 20 minutes to change your belief system, not 20 centuries. A good place for me to start would be with a patient. I first published a paper on HBNC <laughs> in 1982, and then my first part of the journey completed in the mid-1990s when I became a consultant, so you spend 10 years just doing nothing but working. Um, and I'd started to try and work out something about H1C, but I let it go. I mischievously started hacking blood glucose monitors, meters, and downloading their content. So this is from the, ninth, the early 2000s, maybe. It's a hacked blood glucose meter download from a patient, where the mean blood glucose was 5.9. All diabetologists with more than 20 years consultanthood experience, please put your hands up now. Melanie, come on, own up. Right. Um, could you quickly estimate what the HbA1c is from that blood glucose? Mean blood glucose, 5.9. Most fasting blood glucose levels, less than 7. Melanie, quickly. Huh? Quickly. Quickly. Okay. Mean blood glucose was 5.9. HbA1c, 8.8, 8.7, 8.8, 8, over a period of time, very consistently at a level. Type 2 diabetes on insulin. Loads of referrals to lots of diabetes nurses to try and improve the glycemic control. Poor control. GP confused. And the patient, very frustrated, because what was conveyed to her was that she was being economical with the truth. And in fact, the blood glucose monitoring data at that time was entirely full of patients are economical with the truth. 5.9, eight and a half, and the fructosamine, an ignored measure, um, which I'll come to later, was actually good. Now, there is a very simple way of standardizing measures, which was used in the run-up trials to the DCCT before they standardized for HbA1c. And I utilized that, which is the fructosamine divided by the upper limit of normal of fructosamine, time the upper limit of normal of H1C, I call it the Mickey Mouse method, gives you an estimated uh, H1C from fructosamine. 
6.4%, the F HbA1c. So this HbA1c is 2.3 units lower than that which is measured. And this gap is a negative gap. If it had been higher, it would have been a positive gap. Negative and positive glycation gap. This is CG was not alone. Um, I eventually got around to doing a bit more work on it. Here is an Altman Bland plot of the HbA1c against the difference between the HbA1c and the FHbA1c, the gap. Now just look at this. Seven units, seven HbA1c percent below the reading. Six units, six HbA1c percent above. 95% confident intervals, just less shy of three either way. <coughs> That's a massive difference. So 10 years later or 15 years later, this is now 31,000 paired H1C fructosamine sets from our 10-year data. Um, and this shows you the distribution of the gap. And you can see that the glycation gap can be negative a long way and positive a long way. Just a health warning, our methodology uh, in the Independent Republic of Wolverhampton is now standardized. However, there is no standardized methodology between research groups, and there is another meth method called the HGI, hemoglobin glycation index, which is derived from blood glucose, which says the same thing, but in a different way. So there's many confusing ways of doing this, but ours is right. Not. Here are those 31,119 estimates. Here's the H1C. Here is the F H1C. It's the fructose mean, but mathematically we've converted so you can com compare like with like. So 7, 8, 9, 10, good, um, excellent, good, acceptable, poor, very poor. So if you take somebody who's got excellent control according to the HbA1c, you will see that quite a lot of them, according to fructosamine, are really bad. And if you take people who've got really bad control according to HbA1c, you will see quite a lot of them are really good. This is rather confusing, but it at least brings to your attention the scope for error. So this is a variety of ways of looking at an error grid analysis. People here categorized as excellent control according to HbA1c could actually be in a variety of other categories. People with poor control could be in other categories. There is a potential for a problem here. I will return to clinical error towards the end of the presentation. But if you look at that categorization I gave you, and look to see whether fructosamine and HbA1c were saying the same thing in blocks. That is in blocks, not in, did they both say 7.7, .7, but in blocks, around about a 50% concordance. Around about 40% one block disunity, which in clinical error terms is not that important. Yeah? No, you're not average, you're good, or you're a bit poor. Not too bad. But in 15% of patients, it's a two-block discordance. And that, in error grid analysis terms, means that you may make a mistake. So, it is, of course, at around about this point in the um, uh, um, at the turn of uh, this decade, uh, most people who didn't believe in the glycation gap said that it was a statistical error. And indeed, there is great potential for statistical error. There is a thing called spurious correlation. If you use values read at the same time and do multiple calculations from them, you end up with the likelihood of spurious error. So I now need to convince you that this is not a spurious statistical phenomenon. So here are 
we published in 2011. Here are people who had a H1C and fructose mean estimation done at some time, and we worked out the glycation gap, and we went back to see the H1C, A1C, and fructose mean estimation at least a year before. So if the gap is, let's say, negative, and it's a spurious phenomenon, the next set of gaps will have a normal distribution of gaps being both negative and positive. So if you multiply negative by negative, you get positive. And if you multiply positive by positive, you get positive. But if you multiply negative and positive, you get negative. So we did that. We're multiplying a glycation gap with a glycation gap from before. And you will see, statistically speaking, that there is a quadratic relationship of um, the last H1C gap and the product of those two things, meaning that statistically, this is a consistent phenomenon. Does that make sense? Okay, if this is a random phenomenon, then there should be no associated demographic factors linked to this factor. So this is people who we found had a positive gap consistently and a negative gap consistently, noting that we have positive and negative gaps consistently. This is now old data, 2013, um, but in the 30,000 people, we can really demonstrate that consistency. There should be no difference, but positive gap patients are older. There are less males. They have a different ethnic mix. There are more smokers. There's more type 2 diabetes. They have shorter duration of diabetes. They are both heavier and shorter. And their BMI uh, is heavier. If this is a spurious phenomenon, then there should be no association between the glycation gap and the complications of diabetes, whereas we know there is an association between glycation and the complications of diabetes. The positive G gap patients, people, for any blood glucose level, they have more glycation. For any blood glucose level, they have a higher HbA1c. For any blood glucose level, you would think that they would have worse complications. And they do. Not massively so, but more retinopathy. More uh, nephropathy is measured by ACR. Look at the difference between macrovascular cardiologists. Wake up. <laughs> Look at the difference. The renal doctors, unfortunately, were excluded from the ribbing. I'm not sure what that means. Um, but there is a difference in the prevalence of macrovascular disease. The 10-year CHD risk score was higher, framing them. Um, but look at the mortality data. I really thought that mortality would be different. But it is. So these are our cohort of patients, which we published in 2013 again, first publication of mortality outcomes with the glycation gap. Now these are people with a neutral glycation gap, uh, plus or minus one either side of the value. Um, the positive ones are greater than plus one, and the negative is greater than minus one. And, there, and this follow-up um, for that cohort um, shows that there is a big difference in mortality between the positive and the neutral glycation gap group. But so too for the negative glycation gap. Something very different between death and the vascular complications of diabetes. So, so far, this is Wolverhampton, 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 and Wolverhampton, and nobody ever believes me. But here is a cord. 
when we challenged Accord um, uh, and Advance, um, I think something must have registered somewhere. Accord used uh, H uh, fasting blood glucose. Accord was an intervention study in type 2 <coughs> diabetes looking at intensive input, really intensive input, um, and they measured fasting blood glucose and HbA1c. And again, you can see the scatter of HbA1c across the range of fasting blood glucose. They used the HGI to calculate um, this gap. And here is positive gap, which they call a high HGI. Here is the negative gap, which they call a low HGI. And here are the neutral guys. An important thing to show from this, as you would expect from the calculations, is the distribution of fasting blood glucose was exactly the same between the groups. Now, Accord showed no benefit in their primary cardiovascular outcomes. Or actually, if you really look at it, you'd wonder whether the intensive group in dark here was worse. But they went on uh, to look at um, the difference according to the gap. Now, this hard lines are the intensive group. And you can see that the positive gap group stands out as being the ones that had really bad outcomes. And in fact, adjusting for this, the other groups, the neutral uh, and uh, negative group, actually had a statistically significant benefit hidden away inside the data. And all of you guys now doing all these complicated studies, please take the message of Accord home. There is something to tease out about propensity to benefit and harm um, from the glycation gap. People are just not looking at it. If you look at hypoglycemia, massive impact of hypoglycemia of their intensive intervention protocol, then these people were differentially impacted. This is the intensive group. But the positive ones, more so. So if I have a HbA1c of 8%, and my protocol says smack, 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 but really my fasting blood glucose was 5.9, I am going to be in big trouble. These studies show that the people most likely to have hypoglycemia were those with a high HbA1c, which is weird and anti-intuitive, but it was only when they looked at the glycation gap they worked out why it was. There was an interplay between hypoglycemia and mortality, but adjusting for that, um, the intensive people, as we all now know, had higher mortality. And here you can see the mortality outcome for the positive glycation gap population, which was bad. But let's just look at that in more detail, because the data I showed you was the follow-up of the whole Wolverhampton population which had a duration of diabetes of 12 years. The population in record had a short, much shorter duration of diabetes. There's the bad mortality outcome for the positive glycation gap patients. Here is the mortality outcome for the negative. Now, this did not reach statistical significance, but I think, you will think, that if they followed that on a while, there is a problem. Positive and negative glycation gap patients die more, I believe. So you still don't believe me. What you want is an underlying biochemical process for the glycation gap. So in around about the mid-2000s, um, we all believe that glycation products, covalent bond, it's never going to get broken. It's a bit like, you know, uh, believing that things will always work. However, a set of enzymes, and in particular um, uh, FN3K, uh, fructosamine-3 kinase, is a deglycation enzyme. Nature, not surprisingly, has a mechanism for taking off um, glycated products. Well, now the interesting thing about this is all of these deglycation enzymes are intracellular. 
So if you have an extracellular protein or set of proteins, and fructosamine is like a soup of glycation, they are not going to be deglycated. But if you have an intracellular protein, whoops, hemoglobin, it is subject to both glycation and deglycation. And the level of its glycation is the balance between the two. So we then looked at a cohort of patients who were consistently, over a long period of time, positive or negative glycators. And this is the FN3K protein concentration. And this is the FN3K enzyme activity. And for any First of all, the concentration levels were lower in the positive G-gap patients. But at any given concentration, um, the negative glycation gap patients... Now, this is a log curve, and you're not going to believe this, but it's a three-fold higher activity of FN3K. And we have replicated that. We've just published this, relatively just by my standards. Um, nobody else has published this at all, and I'm a bit worried about that, but we've replicated it, and we found it to be consistent. So the G-gap can be measured. The G-gap is consistent over time. It is associated with the demographic. It is associated with vasculopathy. It's associated with mortality, but oddly so. It has a biochemical explanation, which is yet to be verified by other research groups. Is this not a phenotype? Is there a genotype? Now, if there are any geneticists in the audience, at this point, can I totally reassure you, I have no idea what I'm talking about. And that is the only time I will admit that fact. But well, we've looked at a whole variety of SNPs, because PhD students like doing SNPs, uh, and we can find no difference in a variety of SNPs, whether they are related to uh, FN3K directly or other interesting things. We've looked at epigenetics, again, because PhD students need something to do. And as far as we can see in the simple epigenetics, uh, methylation, telomere length, and this, that, and the other, we can find no difference. <laughs> Human genome studies have looked to see um, if a variety of genes account for HbA1c variability. And there's a soup of genes that account for sort of about 10 or 11% of variance in HbA1c. And yet John Yudkin, in the 1990s, in the um, Whittingham Heart Study, was called that, uh, but it was done in the Whittingham, uh, um, showed consistently that a substantial amount of variation in HbA1c was not due to blood glucose. And David Leslie and um, Cohen uh, in America, um, in twins, showed that somewhere around 60% of the variability of HbA1c was not described by blood glucose. So I've just taken a bet that it's not going to be worthwhile looking at the genome to find out what the cause of this is. And that's probably because nobody will ever do it for me if I ask them to. But we think there are so many other factors. Is the gene transcripted? If it's transcripted, are there splice variants? If, it, if the messenger RNAs go out, um, will they be processed? What about microRNA? It's so complicated and so unlikely that it's going to be one pathway that we are very close to, and I really hope today that I would have given you the data, but it's going through the big data with the big data boys, that with transcriptome analysis, looking at all mRNA, we will be able to identify key pathways of biochemistry that underlie this. I can't believe I'm doing this work, and it's largely down to the fantastic, clever people I work with, but it's fascinatingly interesting. Before I wrap up, and uh, before questions and answers, can I just say, yeah, can I please just say, 
there is nothing wrong with fructosamine. There are masses of publications showing that fructosamine relates to blood glucose just as well as Hb1c. The reason fructosamine isn't liked are two reasons. One, it's been damned because it's always compared to Hb1c. So if Hb1c is doing this, fructosamine is going to look rubbish because we think Hb1c is the gold standard, so fructosamine looks like it does that. And the second thing is, Biochemists always want a specific measure, but diabetologists ought to want a, a global measure of glycation. Don't let anybody convince you that glycated albumin is a good idea. It is not. We don't want specific here. I think one of the mistakes was moving from total H1C to specific HbA1C. And also, if you use H1C and fructosamine to predict blood glucose, they are equally good. I think here is the slide that I would like to show you. Of course, the Greeks worked out the Earth was round by triangulation. Yeah? I've been telling you about two points, H1C and fructosamine, and I alluded to, despite everything else I've told you, that there is a potential for spurious associations. So this is blood glucose data from all those blood glucose monitors I hacked but never monetized, something else I could have learned from cardiologists, maybe. Looking at um, the variation from H1C, either if you do the blood glucose method, which is called the HGI by Americans, and they favor that, um, or from the fructosamine method. And it's very, very simple. The deviation, whether you use blood glucose, mean blood glucose, and fructosamine from HbA1C by quintile of H1C, is exactly the same. It's the triangulated proof that HbA1c is wrong. But it's not wrong. I'll come back to why it's not wrong. So, first of all, in your clinics, look out for H1c deviation. It's just clinical sense. You look at that blood glucose monitoring book or that blood glucose meter, you do a fructosamine, if two of the things say the same thing, more or less, you can tell what is right and wrong. Take great care in setting targets in those with a gap. You will inflict harm. That's the message of accord. People who had a positive gap were overtreated and came to harm. Not that I'm sure there's a direct connection there, but they came to harm. Please get fructosamine assays up and running and watch out for glycated albumin. Extremely expensive, hard to do. The Southeast Asia is going bonkers over it, and the Americans are trying to get it going, but fructosamine is cheap and cheerful. Remember, the glycation gap may well now become a new predictor of complications. Remember mortality. Remember that... Um, we are using H1C for screening and diagnosis of diabetes, and that's a problem. But we may actually have to start thinking about defining the glycation gap in the normal population and start screening for it. I don't know the answer to that yet, um, and we're going to try and see if we can get a handle on that. Maybe it's a new target for intervention if we can modify the enzyme or the other processes around it. It is a rapidly, it's, I feel that three or four groups around the world have been poddling along on like this and nobody else, and now it's gone bang. Um, but it's not in the UK mindset. It's much more, I think, in the American mindset, HGI. It's not in the UK mindset. Because, you know, the UK guys, you ask them to line up, and they line up. You ask them to believe in H1C, and they believe in the H1C. You rowdy Americans, though, you like, don't like standard stuff like that. But it is rapidly expanding. So, the Earth is not flat. 20 minutes. HbA1c is not the gold standard measure of glycemic control. Anybody believe me? Hands up. Hands up. Come on, come on. 
Whoa, that's not too bad for a paradigm shift. Can I really say, however, H1C is not the gold standard measure of glycemic control, but the gly H1C should now start to be seen as the gold standard measure of the glycation gap. And the glycation gap in its own right is something really interesting. The glycation gap is an important paradigm shift in clinical science and practice. I think, I'm not quite totally confident about that yet, but please, mind the gap. <laughs>